Ready? Um, hello, that was a long, slow introduction. Um, thank you, Andy. Thank you, Ingmarie, for the uh, invitation to uh, be part of your session. I think you introduced me. I may have, I may have invited myself. I can't remember. Um, Alfred Jell has had a tough time of it lately. At first, his art and agency was treated with great enthusiasm. It revolutionized the debate on objects and agency. But once the inevitable tide had turned, his work was left a little stranded. Critiqued for the, anthropo, uh, the uh, anthropocentrism of his concept of secondary agency. Needless to say, Jell never really went away, and we've been seeing that today um, in a work by uh, Jody Joy, but also in Chris Cosden's recent chapter in Extending Objects, and uh, Andy himself has worked on Jell. The question that motivates this paper is, what is anthropocentrism, uh, excuse me, what is anthropomorphism? Specifically, what is it when it appears in a ceramic forms from first millennia CE Northwest Argentina? Unreformed gel cannot answer that question for me, but a modified gel might. What I propose in this paper, therefore, is to meld ontological archaeology, naturally, with a gelian formal analysis. The goal is to unlock the underlying principles expressed through the ceramics in order to generate concepts that can both shine a light on the original context and challenge what it is we think we know about anthropomorphism. That is, can a formal analysis of the specifics of the pots lead to new concepts? Uh, and in this way, can it answer some of the questions that Andy um, introduced us to in his introduction about images? So, I'm going to take Jell's work on Marquesan art as both a lesson in formal analysis and as a counterpoint to an ontological approach. I then fumble towards a formal analysis of anthropomorphic La Candelaria ceramics from northwest Argentina. And from there to the question of making. I claim that it's through a focus on the making of the images that we get a glimpse of how these conceptual worlds may have gotten, may be gotten at through the ceramics. And I'll tell you the answer now to my question. And I find that this is in keeping with a long, uh, time-honoured tradition of tag presentations. The answer to my question is, I don't know. Um, what I do know, though, is something very different is going on when we talk about anthropomorphism through this light. Gell's formal analysis of artworks attempted to define a style and show the relationship between that style and society. And I'll come clean here. What I really want to, do, to know is whether this type of analysis can be used with an ontological approach. But why turn to Gell at all? The question I've been asking for some time is how to get at ontological difference through, for example, these pots. I realise you haven't seen any of the pots yet, but I promise I'll show you some. In the past, I've made general arguments on the basis of general observations and theories. But what about the specific details of the pots? I think they call out for a Jellian stylistic analysis. And that is because Jell wanted to understand the relationship between style and a given culture, but, but without collapsing one into the other, and outside of a representationalist framework. So how did he do this? Style, in Jell's term, uh, terms, is simply the, and I quote, formal attributes of artworks. His formal analysis produced a list of the key characteristics of, say, Marquesan art, such that this list can only refer to that body of work and not some other. The Marquesan corpus consists of motifs in tattoos, carved objects and architectural elements. The repertoire of motifs can all be derived from each other through a series of transformations. It is the principles governing those transformations from one motif to another that make up the list that constitutes the Marquesan style. 
the result is that our axes of coherence that run through that style and distinguish just those artefacts from any other culture's artefacts. In the Marquesian case, Jal shows us that the key principle is that of least difference. The trick is to change a motif or image such that it differs as a little from another without remaining identical. For example, the translation from two-dimensional to three-dimensional art consists in wrapping a flat image around a tubular core. This is not really three-dimensional art at all, he says. It is as little different from two-dimensional as it can be. It is only at this point, only after the formal analysis, that Gell attempts to make connections between the world of artefactual forms and that of social forms. In the Marquesian case, the principle of least difference that distinguishes artworks from each other matches the careful hierarchical social distinctions that must be maintained against the background of undifferentiation in Marquesian society. Artifacts, however, do develop independently of any cultural dictates. The connection between artifacts and other cultural parameters is that of relations between artifacts working in the same way as relations between people. And this is his famous dictum. Relations between relations, in his, in his phrase, is what are compared in formal analysis. So, to up Gell's ontological ante means to attempt to give his formal analysis an ontological resonance. I have described elsewhere an ontological archaeology as a recursive enterprise. It's our conceptual apparatus that is the target of archaeological exploration as much as the reconstruction of past societies and their ontologies. This line is legibly derived from the work of anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro. What Viveros proposes, in fact, is that Amerindian indigenous ideas, and he works in the Amazon, Amerindian indigenous ideas be treated as concepts. The task, he says, is to determine the preconceptual ground that such concepts presuppose and the material realities that they create. In archaeological terms, can we extract concepts from the preconceptual grounds of our materials? Can the pots provide this? So here's the rub. Can Gel help determine what these concepts are through formal analysis? Is it possible to extract conceptualizations that can be mobilized as concepts? The axes of coherence that he talks about, produced in a formal analysis, could they form the basis of the concept work, the bringing to light of the conceptual potential in the artefacts? There's one, well, there's lots actually, but there's one pressing concern at least in this matching of JAL with an ontological approach. JAL's art theory famously measures impact through psychological salience. Viveris's concept approach is staunchly anti-psychologizing. And I quote, to treat, and this is Viveris, to treat indigenous ideas as concepts is to take an anti-psychologizing stance, since what is at stake here is an image of thought irreducible to empirical cognition. Mind you, there is still something tempting in Jell's claim that style is not a taxonomy, but rather has psychological salience that artworks do not do their cognitive work, do not do their cognitive work, sorry, in isolation, but rather cooperate on the basis of style. For style, excuse me, for my purposes here, it is worth thinking about Gell's style as producing conceptual rather than psychological effects, and on a far broader audience, including the archaeologists themselves. Can we switch the focus from cognition to concept? So, my hunch is that a gel style formal analysis can get at the underlying concepts that La Candelaria Potts might reveal some concepts that have ontological valence. I'll sketch the steps involved here, though I'm afraid you will get little analysis yet. That's the tag aside. 
steps towards an onto formal analysis. First, then, one needs to be primed to respond to metaconceptual questions that GEL does not take on. For example, GEL talks in general about visual logics and argues that the theory of style is an extension of the theory of perception. But what is vision, as we saw from the previous uh, session? What is perception? Amazonian theories of vision and perception are quite different. So these need to be mined beforehand. Second, the formal analysis of the pods is undertaken to reveal this axes of coherence. So this is a fairly traditional Jellian step. And third, these axes of coherence are mobilized as concepts and put into play against our concepts, such as anthropomorphism. I'll point towards some of the possibilities of a formal analysis and the hard work of conceptualizing these relations is only hinted at, and that's being generous. So this is what I've got so far. The axes of... Oh, do you want to see a pot? Does that help? There you go. <laughs> Spectacular, a bit scary. Kind of psychological impact of the pot. OK, the axes of coherence in La Candelaria ceramics are, I argue, about, one, relationships between volumes, and two, the embellishment of volumes with applied or incised elements. The differentiation of pots into volumes is marked by what I call cinch, a cinching technique, cinching technique, where joins or joints are exaggerated. This results in the clear delimitation of volumes and their marking out as significant. All right, so small pots. Um, so the smaller of these pots that I'm looking at can be divided into roughly two groups on the basis of their volumes. Um, the first, uh, indicated in the top image here, I call bilaterally asymmetrical, uh, given their body shapes. And the second are what I call teardrop shapes, a bit poetically. So these are the basic volumes in this class of uh, material. What is of interest is how these basic volumes interact with the rest of the elements, as well as how they interact with each other. For example, the teardrop relates closely to another basic volume, which I call the bulge. The bulge comes in varying sizes and is often an unadorned addition to a main volume. They are hollow. They also serve as the basis for the addition of other elements, uh, which you can see here, such as frogs' bodies, mammalian heads, or humans. Clues to the relationship between volumes are provided by a small number of obviously anthropomorphic vessels. These are seated figures made up of several volumes and bulge-like legs. Each volume is cinched as it joins another, as you can see in the waistline of this figure and uh, where the head joins the body. Legs are cinched top and bottom and the neckline is strongly marked. So we move back to the other pot. Moving back to the asymmetrical and teardrop pots, one can now recognize that the cinching recurs in key locations, joins between volumes, and especially the neck body, and any time a bulge joins a larger volume. Judging from the anthropomorphic pots, the previous uh, slide I showed you, these are not conceptualized as delimiting different bodies, but rather zoning a single body. There is also another class of anthropomorphic vessel. Um, this is another example of cinching. There is another class of anthropomorphic vessel, of which there are very, very few, that depicts figures carrying large pots. The relationship between the ceramic jug on these figures, on these figures' backs, is reproduced in many of the teardrop and asymmetrical pots, just in a much less obvious way. The key elements are an open vessel B, connected to the closed vessel in the shape of a body, which is A. The affinity in shape with the more naturalistic is re repeated in the other pots. And the cinching marks the distinction, such as the cinching around the neck, such that volumes A and B are repeated in the other pots. The head may also be repeated on the back of the pot as the homunculi, which there are various types. This happens to be a humanoid looking one. So these are some of the 
broad relationships, and I could show you many examples. In addition to these, other relationships exist in the elements that are applied to these basic forms. The one I've traced most consistently is the formal identity between front, uh, frog's legs and faces with anthropomorphic heads. So here are two close-ups. The legs of the frog, which are not clearly seen in this photo, the front legs of the frog are formed in an, in an identical way to the eyebrows of the humanoid face, wrapping around the brow to form, in one case, the nose of the frog, and in the other, the humanoid nose. And there are many other such relations to be traced. And I'm not going to give any more at this point. So the question remains, how do these observations relate to concept production? In Gell's final analysis, both culture and artefacts emerge from abstract principles that generate possibilities of form in both social life and artworks. These principles are embedded in the lives or minds that are thoroughly Marquesan. He writes, and to quote Jell, stylistic decisions from which the coherence, stability, and long-term transformations of the Marquesan style ensued were taken without deliberate reflection, but never without cognizance of a prevailing social context of social forms pervaded by a dread of spiritual political transgression. Surely it is this process of making, of exactly how those general principles get into the pots, that provides the dynamism that links image to ontological context, uh, concept. That is, acts of making are not adjuncts to a product, but rather fully involved in the act of creation or transformation. Amazonian ethnographies frequently allude to the ontological importance of making. In Peter Gow's analysis of Pyro design, for example, he describes the act of fabrication of geometric designs on cloth or on bodies as intrinsic to the meaning of the design, and that is because good design originates in the knowledge and skill of old women. To push Gell's point ontologically, then, we could argue that the Lacandelaria's potter's dread extends beyond a conservative social context to include a broader audience, risks that are ontological. The form that the pot takes, the gestures that produce incised marks, plastic additions, or coils and cinches, clay volumes, these are all part of the effective actions that keep a world together. It is the making where other worlds lie. And uh, this is my conclusion. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>